Welcome to Special Investigator, a podcast devoted to classic true crime murder stories. And today's murder story is Voodoo Slaughter. Official Detective Magazine published Virgin Islands Voodoo Slaughter in August of 1991. But for this podcast, I shortened the title to Voodoo Slaughter. And now I'm going to translate the written words into spoken words. By the way, if you want a copy of the story in flipbook form, just click the link and it's yours to keep, no charge. Now, let's get into Voodoo Slaughter. I just observed a man on Vesip Bay Beach. A female caller tells the police operator he was hacking away at a body with a machete. It's 7.22 on the morning of March 2, 1988, and the call is coming into police headquarters in the town of Charlotte Amalia, which is a world-class seaport located on the island of St. Thomas, approximately mid-island and on the south shore. The operator passes the info along to Captain Raymond Hinman and he immediately dispatches a team of officers to the scene, with Captain Celestino White in charge. Vesip Bay Beach is a picturesque but usually deserted beach on the eastern tip of St. Thomas. It's a long stretch of white sand with sea grape trees and cacti lining the back edge of the beach, and scores of sailboats and motorboats sit anchored just offshore in Vesip Bay. It's a short distance from the beach to the town of Red Hook, which sits on the eastern tip of St. Thomas. Now let's flash back 20 minutes. Genevieve Lewis walks out of her white pastel home. The home sits up in the hills near the easternmost tip of St. Thomas, overlooking the port of Red Hook. She's accompanied by her Newfoundland retriever named Baudelaire. They get in the car and start driving. Genevieve is 53 years old. She was born on the French island of St. Pierre and Miquelon, which is just off the coast of Newfoundland on the eastern edge of Canada next to Quebec, and it's about 2,200 miles to the north. She spent the first 26 years of her life on that island, but she visited St. Thomas in 1961 and decided to stay. She got a job managing a beach club, and four years later, she met a fishing boat captain. They fell in love and got married. The marriage produced two daughters, one studying in Paris, and the other working as a theatrical stylist on Broadway. 18 months ago, Genevieve suffered a cranial aneurysm that nearly took her life. Still recuperating, and as part of her long-term recovery program, she takes a walk with her dog every morning on Vesip Bay Beach. She reaches the beach a few minutes after seven and parks her car. Then she and the pooch start walking along the white sand beach. As far as she can tell, no one else looks to be on the beach. Around the same time, Steve Cornish starts walking along a dirt pathway at the other end of the beach. That path leads from Cabrita Point onto the beach. Cabrita Point is an upscale condominium development adjacent to the beach. Steve is 29 years old and a native of Lansing, Michigan. Three years ago, He visited his uncle, who lives in a condo on Cabrita Point. Steve fell in love with the island, fell in love with windsurfing, and decided to stay. He soon became an excellent windsurfer and competed and won several competitions. He now lives in the Smith Bay section of the island a few miles to the west. But he visited his uncle last night and spent the night in his uncle's condo. Steve rarely walks across Vesip Bay Beach. But today, he's running late for work, so he decides to take a shortcut. He's a landscaper, and he's carrying a pair of pruning shears. So that makes two people and one dog walking on Vesip Bay Beach 20 minutes ago. And right now, Captain White and a team of officers are arriving at Vesip Bay Beach. The beach looks deserted, but the officers are soon looking at a grisly crime scene. They see a headless body of a white female lying in the sand. The left arm and left leg have been detached from the body, and both limbs are lying in the sand close to the body. The victim's abdomen has been sliced wide open, and her internal organs are hanging out, but the head is nowhere to be seen. The carcass of a large brown dog is lying in the sand a few feet from the woman's body, and the dog has also been mutilated. 
Additional officers and curious onlookers soon begin flocking to the crime scene. So the captain secures the beach, establishes a dragnet around the surrounding area, and begins to theorize about what went down. He's acting fast because, the way he sees it, the killer escaped on foot and might still be hiding in the underbrush rimming the beach. Or, perhaps, he waded into the shallow water and slipped aboard one of the sailboats or motorboats anchored just offshore. What could be worse, the killer might have already made his way to Red Hook. There, he can pay two dollars to take the ferry across Pillsbury Sound to Cruise Bay on the island of St. John. And if he gets that far, he can easily disappear. St. John is 20 square miles of mountains and undeveloped land, and it's mostly uninhabited. Even worse, If the killer makes it to St. John, for a few dollars more, he can take another ferry and reach the British Virgin Islands of Tortola and Virgin Gordon. And if he gets that far, he escapes U.S. jurisdiction. So, Captain White secures the beach and establishes a dragnet around the surrounding area. He alerts the Coast Guard, calls for a helicopter, and he alerts authorities on St. John and the surrounding British Islands, warning them to be on the lookout for the killer. Forensic technicians arrive and start taking measurements and snapping pictures. At the same time, officers begin questioning onlookers. And that's when an officer yells, Over here! He just found the body of a white male 500 feet further up the beach at the edge of a dirt path that leads from the beach onto Cabrita Point. And just like that, the police are looking at a double homicide. At the same time, Genevieve Lewis' husband arrives for work at a nearby marina and he hears the commotion. When he asks bystanders if they know what's going on, someone mentions that some sort of incident just took place on Vesic Bay Beach. Knowing that his wife just drove to Vesic Bay Beach to walk their dog boat away, he gets back in his pickup truck and drives over to investigate. When he arrives, he sees his wife's car parked nearby. He gets out of his pickup but the police deny him access to the beach. So he returns to the marina, boards his 21-foot diesel inboard, and approaches the beach from the water. Once close to the beach, he sets anchor and waves ashore, and this time, officers allow him to access the beach. And now, he's looking at the body of a white female lying on the sand. Even though his wife's head is nowhere in sight, he easily identifies her engagement ring, wedding ring, and wristwatch. No doubt about it. The dead female is his wife, Genevieve Lewis, and he breaks down and starts crying. At the same time, Steve Cornish's uncle hears the commotion on the beach. So he walks along the path leading to the beach and soon comes upon officers looking down at a dead white male. He takes one look at the body and identifies the victim. It's his nephew, Steve Cornish. Meanwhile, Eyewitnesses keep showing up and providing investigators with vital information. I saw a naked black man, one woman says. He was walking along the beach and tapping a machete against his leg. And her description of the suspect matches the earlier one given by the 911 caller. I heard screaming, says a boater who was anchored 30 yards offshore. So I grabbed my camera and started taking pictures. I watched the killer cut off the woman's head one of her legs, and one of her arms. Then I watched the killer disembowel her in a careful and methodical manner. A second boater adds more. I watched the killer strip off his clothes after he killed the woman. Then he took a big piece of cement and started smashing what was left of the torso. He crushed the woman's skull, then he calmly walked into the water and started washing off her blood. I heard blood-curdling screams says a woman who lives close to the beach. So I came over to investigate. I saw the killer come out of the water, pick up a machete, then continue walking down the beach. He soon came face to face with a white man who was entering the beach. Then I watched him viciously slash the victim and sadistically mutilate the body. Every eyewitness gives an almost identical description of the killer. And several officers think it rings a bell. It sounds like a man familiar to the St. Thomas Police Department. On an island the size of St. Thomas, 
most officers are familiar with habitual offenders, and the descriptions sound like a 34-year-old native of St. Kitts who migrated to St. Thomas six years ago. He worked as a bartender for a short while, but remained unemployed for most of the time he lived on St. Thomas. He ran afoul of the law on several occasions and has a history of drug abuse and erratic behavior. His condition worsened four years ago when his wife bore another man's child and she ran off to live with the other man. Three years ago, officers arrested him at the airport when he tried to board a plane bound for St. Kitts without a ticket. An altercation ensued and an officer had to shoot him in the leg to subdue him. And this year, he's already been arrested twice since New Year's Day. Two months ago, January 22nd, officers arrested him for assaulting an unarmed man with a pickaxe. Unable to post a $5,000 bail, he went to jail. But he was released 12 days later because the arrest had been mishandled. On February 15th, just 16 days ago, officers arrested him on a misdemeanor charge of indecent exposure for parading around naked at a local shopping center. Upon his arrest, doctors treated him and detected one of the highest levels of the hallucinogenic drug PCP ever recorded in the Virgin Islands. Doctors committed him to St. Thomas Hospital for treatment of drug abuse, but a week later, on February 22nd, he was released from the hospital to begin treatment as an outpatient. The man they're now looking for is St. Clair Daniel. So, the mystery seems to be gone, but not the suspense. The police know now that they're looking for St. Clair Daniel, but they have to find him and arrest him. And if they get that far, then the justice system has to try him and get a conviction, while his attorneys will most likely use the insanity defense in an attempt to get him off. Captain White sends one pair of officers to stake out the dock at Red Hook. He sends another pair to watch the airport, and he gets about a dozen officers to begin a manhunt, starting at the scene of the crimes and expanding outward. Over here, one officer yells when he finds the decapitated head of Genevieve Lewis in thick underbrush a few feet off the beach. Another officer finds a bloody machete under a giant sentry plant. So Captain White now believes the suspect is in arm, but he still considers him dangerous. A few minutes pass. An officer hears a rustling noise and draws his gun, but it's a false alarm. It's just an iguana darting out of the bush and dashing away. But it's no false alarm minutes later when officers hear footsteps coming from some nearby bushes. They look and see a naked, gap-toothed man stepping toward them. He's holding his hands in the air and his body is covered with dried blood spots. Take it easy on me, the naked man says. The officers recognize the naked man to be St. Clair Daniel. They inform him that they want to question him about what happened on the beach, and he gives them permission to transport him to police headquarters. At police headquarters, Captain White reads St. Clair Daniel's rights, then a pair of homicide detectives begin interrogating him. Meanwhile, other officers are taxing witnesses back and forth between the crime scene and police headquarters, taking sworn statements and having the witnesses attempt to identify the suspect in lineups. Three witnesses say he resembles the man they saw, but they're not 100% sure. But seven witnesses positively identify him. After five hours of interrogation, St. Clair Daniel signs a confession stating that he thought Genevieve Lewis's dog was going to attack him, so he chopped at the dog with his machete. Then, thinking that Genevieve Lewis would retaliate by taking out a gun and shooting him, he slashed at her and killed her. In regard to Steve Cornish, he thought Steve was a police officer coming to arrest him, so he killed him too. At 4.45 p.m., less than 10 hours after the grisly machete murders in Paradise, the police arrest St. Clair Daniel and arraign him in district court in Charlotte, Amalia. St. Clair Daniel is wearing gray surgical scrubs with his hands and feet shackled as he appears before the magistrate. He hears the charges against him. 
Two counts of first degree murder, two counts of mayhem, and one count of carrying a dangerous weapon. Under the advice of the public defender assigned to his case, St. Clair Daniel pleads not guilty to all charges. Never before has the Virgin Islands seen such grisly murders. Never before have the police rounded up so many eyewitnesses so fast. Never before has the prosecution been afforded the luxury of having eyewitnesses take photographs of the killer as he was methodically murdering his victims. And never before has the Virgin Islands seen such an open and shut murder case. What, will he be convicted? Or will he get off because he's crazy? Ten months pass. On Thursday, January 12, 1989, St. Clair Daniel arrives for his trial wearing a red and blue tracksuit, a tan t-shirt, and blue sneakers. At this point, and throughout most of the trial, he hangs his head low and refrains from speaking. The public defender enters a plea of not guilty to all charges by reason of insanity. But the prosecutor disagrees. The defendant exercised the ability to control his conduct. He hurt the victims as a consequence of his own desires and passions. He knew what he was doing. He was rational. He was criminally responsible. And psychologists and psychiatrists are going to swear to those facts. Now, here comes a surprise. The public defender begins his defense by sneaking voodoo into the equation. When is it rational for a man to kill two people and supposedly hide the murder weapon and his clothes and then walk around naked. He cut up the bodies because he didn't want their jumbies, which means ghosts, coming back to haunt him. The lawyer then smiles a wacky smile at the jury and says, what's rational about that? No, the murders do not have to happen, but they happen because the system failed St. Clair Daniel by not treating his long-term mental illness. The man has a history of aberrant behavior connected to a psychosis. He was mentally ill on the day he committed these murders, and these crimes were a product thereof. The public defender then strings together a series of family members and medical experts who swear that St. Clair Daniel is insane. He's stone mother crazy, one relative says. He said, I'm Lucifer, another testifies. I'm the one who was tossed down from heaven. Then he told me his missing teeth were the mark of the beast. He told me that if I didn't believe him, I must read revelations. He came to my house, says his sister, and swore that a man was chasing him. See him there? He's coming to kill me. Then he locked the door so that the imaginary man couldn't intrude. I was so scared. Oh my God, he is crazy. Then comes the expert witnesses for the defense. First up is a local doctor who treated St. Clair Daniel after he was arrested. Mr. Daniel told me, the doctor testifies, that he killed Genevieve Lewis because he thought she was pregnant and he was afraid that the seed would come back to haunt him. So he disemboweled her to remove the seed. He said, Ja gave me permission because a serpent's inside me and eating away at my heart. Ja, of course, refers to God. Next comes a heavy hitter for the defense. He's an associate professor of psychiatry at Case Western Medical School in Cleveland, Ohio, and he's an expert in forensic psychiatry. He spends nearly a full day on the witness stand stating that St. Clair Daniel is paranoid schizophrenic. He is irrational. He's suspicious and distrustful of others. He may believe he is Jesus Christ, but he can still understand a television program. He misperceived events and translated innocent meetings into sinister encounters. He had been diagnosed as paranoid schizophrenic years ago, and it is not a curable condition. Next comes a psychiatrist from Coral Springs, Florida. Mr. Daniel's case history, he testified, reveals signs of suffering from an increasingly severe psychosis. Mr. Daniel started exhibiting the signs almost 10 years ago. And just look at his posture throughout the trial. 
It's almost catatonic and consistent with schizophrenia. And now it's time for the prosecution's experts. First comes a psychiatrist who practices in the Virgin Islands in Puerto Rico, especially as transcultural psychiatry, and he labels the defendant's mutilation and decapitation of the two victims as pure voodooism. It's a beautiful and very tough religion, he explains, with active branches throughout the Caribbean, especially in such hotbeds as Nevis, Anguilla, and St. Kitts. Voodoo followers fear becoming zombies. They believe that the body of someone who just died an unnatural death immediately threatens the living, whether or not they were responsible for the person's death. They believe that the petite vanage, small angel, hovers over the body for seven days, during which times the corpse cadaver, the body, is capable of zombifying. To prevent this from happening, the head must be cut off and destroyed. So he was just following the rituals of voodoo. He's not crazy. Then comes a psychiatrist from Missouri. Mr. Daniel does have some mental problems. But in my opinion, the murders were not the consequences of mental illness. I think he knew right from wrong. His actions after each murder were consistent with that interpretation. He washed off the blood and then attempted to run away to avoid apprehension. Last up is a clinical psychologist from Atlanta. I examined Mr. Daniel after he was arrested. I administered the Rorschach test with a series of 10 cards with random ink blots. Mr. Daniel identified each one as representing female genitalia. I found no evidence of psychotic delusions. I'm not trying to tell you that Mr. Daniel is completely normal. He does have some problems, but he manifests his deep-seated problems when he uses drugs. The prosecutor then gives his closing remarks. St. Clair Daniel intended to kill these people, and he thought about it before he did it. He wasn't a machine or a robot being driven by mental illness. There are mentally ill people who are good citizens and good neighbors, and there are mentally ill people who are criminals. The murder of Genevieve Lewis wasn't the result of a mental disorder. It's the result of the evil in his own heart. It's a cultural belief not a sign of insanity. If you look far and wide, you can find a psychiatrist who'll say anything. Then the defense sums up its case. Mr. Daniel suffered from delusions. He saw innocent behavior and misconstrued it. He attacked Genevieve Lewis because he thought she was going for a gun to retaliate for his attack on the dog, which is an absolutely irrational belief. But according to the prosecution, all of a sudden, St. Clair Daniel is saying, that's exactly what the government is trying to ram down your throat. And the trial's over, except for the verdict. The jury deliberates for two days. At 4.30 p.m. on Thursday, January 19, 1989, the jury rules. In regard to the death of Steve Cornish, St. Clair Daniel is innocent by reason of insanity. That verdict sends chills throughout the courtroom. Is this sadistic killer going to get away with murder? But in regard to the death of Genevieve Lewis, the jury rules that St. Clair Daniel is guilty of murder in the first degree. Outside the courtroom after the trial ended, some of the jurors explain the rationale for their disparate decision. In regard to the killing of Steve Cornish, they believe that he was a stranger to St. Clair Daniel. The jury believes that St. Clair Daniel suffered a delusion. He misinterpreted the pruning shears Steve Cornish was carrying to be a weapon, possibly a nunchuck. So he was acting in self-defense. But the jurors believe that he knew what he was doing when he killed Genevieve Lewis. Witnesses saw him watching her at a job on several occasions. So he knew her. And other witnesses swore that they saw him escorted out of her office 10 days before the killings in a peaceful, harmless fashion. Therefore, he knew that this woman meant him no harm, and he also knew she carried no gun. 
It shows the jury was thinking, the prosecutor remarks. The jury ended up finding a way to get him the maximum sentence, while at the same time ensuring that he gets psychiatric help. The verdicts send St. Clair Daniel to prison for the rest of his life with no chance for parole. The end. So, that's it for now. Next week, we'll have another classic murder story coming your way. In between, we'll probably add some bits and pieces that fit our agenda. Please feel free to support Special Investigator. This isn't a hobby. Thanks for stopping in, and see you next time.